Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth and today I'll be reading chapter 29, A Major Legal. In 1945, we were a dream coronation. It was nothing to be proud of, but that's the way it was. In the South, everything was segregated. Schools, buses, restaurants, hotels, even phone booths. The rest of the country wasn't as blanded about it, but there was plenty of separation and prejudice. Those who approved a Jim Crow segregation said that things were separate but equal. They were separate all right, but they were barely equal, and they certainly were not on the ball field. When it came to the national pastime, which is what baseball is called, there were the major leagues, the minor leagues, and there were the Negro leagues for ball players of color. The major leaguers played in fine ballparks, traveled first class, and slept in decent hotels. The Negro leaguers, well, they put up with a lot. Shitty conditions, no ballparks of their own, they, they rented what they could find, traveled any way they could make it, and usually lower pay, except for the incredible Satchel Page, who in 1942 managed to make more money than anyone in any league. One thing the Negro Leagues did have in abundance was talent. When black players played all-star games against the white teams, they usually won. Just think about it, and you can see how insane the system was. All those good ball players, and no one letting them play in the majors. There were plenty of whites who understood that, and there were plenty of whites without prejudice. One of them was the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Branch Ricky. Ricky decided he was going to change baseball. He was going to make it the national pastime for all Americans. But he knew it wouldn't be easy. Biden prejudice never is. Ricky was the white man for this job. He had founded a base baseball system of farm teams back in the 1920s. That means he came up with the idea of taking over minor league teams, which had been independently owned, just like the major leagues clubs, and using them to develop ballplayers for the major leagues. Branch Ricky was used to scouting good players. He knew how to pick them. He was also a, a he was also a shrewd businessman. Black ball players then were a pool of inexpensive talent. They played an exciting, hustling kind of baseball, and they would bring a huge new black audience to the majors. If Ricky was going to change baseball and some of the nation's attitudes by integrating the Brooklyn Dodgers, he knew he would have to find a ball player who was not only a great athlete, but even more important, a great person. When he found Jack Roosevelt Robinson, he had just the man he was looking for. Jackie Robinson was a spectacular athlete. He had on letters and trophies and false spots at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. He was very smart and did well in school. And he had the strength to fight for his beliefs. As an officer in the Army, Robinson refused to move when a bus driver asked him to sit in the back of the bus where blacks were expected to sit. That got Jackie in trouble, but he wouldn't back down. He faced a court material and military court for disobedience, but the young lieutenant had acted within his rights. The Army dropped the charges against him. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth and today I'll be reading part 2 of chapter 29 in Major Legal. Some people thought him a troublemaker, but Branch Ricky was impressed. He was a man of courage, he believed. Ricky asked Robinson to come to New York. He said he wanted to talk about a new Negro team. Then in his office, Branch Ricky told Jackie the truth. He wanted him to break baseball's color line. Both men knew the false black ball player in the major leagues wouldn't have it easy. Mickey told Robinson that if he wanted the job, no matter what happened to him, he had to promise not to fight back. He would have to take abuse and hold his tongue. At all times, he would have to be a gentleman. Mr. Ricky, do you want a ball player who's afraid to fight back? I want a player with guts enough not to fight back, said Ricky. Robinson had never backed away from a fight. He knew that if someone insulted him, it would be very difficult to do what Ricky asked to, turn the other cheek. But he agreed. He gave his word. He was going to do something bigger than anything he'd done before. It was more important than his feelings. 
It was for his people and for all people. The two men talked for three hours, though neither of them realized how much courage Jackie Robinson would actually need. He had tough times ahead of him. He was going to be spiked, spat on, sent death threats, hit with pitches, and called awful names. How would you have responded? Branch Vicky began sending Jackie Robinson to Brooklyn's lead, lead and farm team, the Montreal Royals. The Royals manager, Clay Hopper, had grown up with prejudice. He had never had a black friend. He begged Branch Vicky not to make him coach Jackie Robinson. Vicky knew he was a good coach. He told him to do his job. By the end of the season, Hopper had learned a lesson. Most, most prejudice comes from ignorance. He told Robinson, you're a real ball player and a gentleman. It's been wonderful having you on the team. On April 15, 1947, Jackie Robinson, up from Montreal, batted in Brooklyn for the first time as a major legal. He was put on four times that day. He didn't do much before the rest of the week. Had Wookie made a mistake? Then when the Dodgers went to Philadelphia to play the Phillies, even Wookie was stunned by what happened. The Phillies manager, Ben Chapman, sued hate language and encouraged his players to do the same. At no time in my life have I heard of racial venom and dugout abuse to match the abuse that Ben sprayed on Robinson that night to one of Branch Vicky's aides. I can scarcely believe my ears, said Robinson. Jackie Robinson took a deep breath and kept his word. The abuse wasn't all verbal. Runners were sliding and cutting him with their spikes pitchers were thrown at his head. It was too much for his teammates, even those who hadn't wanted a black player on the club. Sometimes actions bring unexpected results. The poor sportsmanship of some other teams brought the Dodgers together. They were behind their new team now. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth and today I'll be reading part 3 of chapter 29 of Major Legal. Soon Robinson was swinging and connecting. And when it came to base running, hardly anyone has ever done it the way Jackie Robinson did. He gave petrol to the generals. And when he stole home, well, have you ever seen anyone steal home? There wasn't much in baseball that is more exciting. Robinson was a fantastic base stealer. In his rookie season, Jackie Robinson finished first in the league in stolen bases and second in runs scored. He tied for the team lead in home runs. Dodger fans began cheering and cheering. The nation's most important sports paper, the Sparty News, which had said that Rookie was unwise to bring a black to the majors, named him Rookie of the Year. In September, the Brooklyn Dodgers won the National League pennant, and at the end of the season, Blanche Rookie told his star, Jackie, you're on your own now. You can be yourself. Robinson no longer had to keep quiet, and he didn't. Jackie Robinson had won the affection and respect of his fellow ball players of, and of the nation. He was the false. He took the punishment. He made it easy for those who followed. Baseball was now the national pastime for all the people. Thank you.